Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for coming to this cryptic Sony sponsored session. <laughs> you have no idea what we're going to talk about. <laughs> I like GDC. And for me, GDC is, like Megan says, where I can get a quick snapshot of what's new and trending in the industry. And also, I can pick up a few new tricks about how to make great games alongside with developers from all over the world. After a hectic week of meeting people and attending sessions, I will leave here inspired by some of the session speakers and the people and friends that I kept catch up with. It's particularly exciting. Sorry, I forgot the slides. <laughs> particularly exciting to talk about innovation at PlayStation and what's coming next. Something which we believe will push the game industry forward. Since the early days of video games, the industry has grown by leveraging technological advancements to create new experiences for game players. Experiences that people maybe were not expecting or didn't know were possible. The way we look at innovation at PlayStation is to focus on pushing the boundary of play. It's this focus that drives how we innovate and create new experiences we deliver to gamers. These are some of the technological advancements that PlayStation has leveraged and brought to the market, most recently with PS4, share button, and remote play. And this summer, we are launching PS Now, a streaming game service that leverages Gaikai's cloud-based technology. In some cases, these innovations have turned into standards in gaming that we take for granted today. Virtual reality or VR. You knew this was coming, right? <laughs> it's the next innovation from PlayStation that may well shape the future of games. Let me start first with how we arrived here, our road to VR. Making games immersive has always been one of the goals of game creators. Game developers have used and experimented with Technological, technologies like 3D graphics, first-person view camera, HD resolution, realistic physics, motion capture, motion input, and augmented reality. All of these have contributed to creating immersion in games. The feeling that you, as a player, are so engrossed within the world that the developer has created you forget that you are actually playing a game. But nothing elevates the level of immersion better than VR. And it goes one step further from immersion to deliver presence. Rick and Anton will discuss this sense of presence more, which can only be realized by VR. VR has been a dream of many game creators ever since the computer game was invented. Many of us at PlayStation have dreamed about VR and what it could mean to the games we create. 
as soon as our developers got their hands on the most accurate consumer-level 3D input device, these guys, PS Move, they started experimenting with VR. These are photos of me trying handmade VR headsets put together by Santa Monica Studios people sitting somewhere here. The left-hand side photo was taken back in fall 2010. They duct taped PS Move controller on a low-res viewer called Headplay. The right one was in March 2011. They used Sony's HMZ personal 3D viewer, which had a higher resolution. And they hacked God War III into a first-person view arena battle demo, where I became Kratos. And uh, here's a short video of that demo. Thank you. <laughs> so that was three years ago on PS3. And actually, the coolest thing about the demo was when I looked down, I saw my body was that of Kratos. <laughs> that was empowering experience, as you could imagine. <laughs> the next video we showed in public actually, so some of you might remember. this video as a promotion for the PSN title Datura in March 2012. This time using Sony's HMZ and two PS Move controllers, one for, one for the head tracking and the other for the hand tracking. Of course, using the HMZ with narrow view angle was not exactly the total immersion that we wanted, but it was enough to show us the potential of VR for games. Soon after our homemade experiment started in 2010, we kicked off our official R&D work to create a VR headset optimized for gaming. We formed a cross-functional global team composed of SCEI hardware group SCEA, R&D, and Worldwide Studios members. This was a similar development process we used to develop PS Vita and PS4, so it's proven to work well for us. By the way, this was a prototype made in 2012 by the SCEA, R&D group, and you can tell they wanted to make the tracking extra accurate. <laughs> With all of that history, I'm thrilled to introduce Project Morpheus, a virtual reality system for PlayStation 4.
Thank you. And uh, actually, uh, I have the actual unit here. Some of you might have guessed where it is. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me show you. for 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> this is the culmination of our work over the last three plus years of, to realize a vision of VR for games and to push the boundaries of play. And this prototype is by no means final. And we will continue to work on this to improve, but we believe it's a good representation of how PlayStation will deliver VR. We are very excited to have you try this in our booth starting tomorrow. Yes. And for you to give us feedback. This prototype also serves as the first development kit for PS4 developers who are as excited and enthusiastic about this space as us. We believe Morpheus will further enhance the world of PS4 with seamless integration with PlayStation Camera, DualShock 4, and PS Move. Morpheus will provide an easy to use plug and play VR experience to consumers and will expand the ecosystem of PS4 with another medium for our publishers and developers to create content. We will continue to improve this prototype by getting direct feedback from you developers. That's why we chose DDC to announce Project Morpheus. We'd like to invite passionate and creative developers to in innovate with us. And as we were working on this project, we have seen passionate and talented people at companies like Oculus VR and Valve introduce their prototypes and share learnings on this exciting technology. I have an enormous amount of respect for them. And we were inspired and encouraged by the enthusiastic reactions by developers and journalists who tried their prototypes. This shows how all of us as an industry can rally around a new medium like VR to push gaming forward. Now I'd like to turn it over to Rick Marx, who will discuss more about the potential of VR and PlayStation's unique position in the market. He'll be followed by Anton Mikhailov, who will share technical details of this prototype and how developers can leverage it to create compelling VR experiences. Thank you. Thanks, you. Actually, you know, one of my favorite things about working at PlayStation is getting to work with someone as passionate about gaming as Shu. So, um, it's also been really great to be part of this project from the very beginning. SCEA R and D has been rare, and uh, it's really truly a global project. Working with guys from Europe and Japan, it's really a great part of my job. And so, let me grab my clicker here. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about VR and what makes it special. The thing that makes VR special really is this, this feeling of being in another physical place. That place could be a realistic place, it could be a fantastic place, both work, but 
it's really that feeling of being somewhere else. And uh, there's just no, there's no way to explain it to you that will make sense, but it's that feeling of presence that we're, Shu already mentioned. It's really very compelling, and you have to experience it to understand what I mean. So I'm not going to talk about it too much more, but how well we can make the technology that lets us achieve that presence is really going to dictate how well VR gets adopted by you know, a large audience. So for me, I, you know, I, I'm actually not a person who all his life has been trying to achieve VR. For me, actually, when I first experienced presence is when I switched from being a supporter of VR to a huge advocate of VR. So actually, I've had a big shift in my belief just by getting to feel it firsthand. Well, just like any new technology, there's an S curve for it. And VR has been on this flat first part of the S for a long time. The trick with the S curve is to know where you are. Now, we're just reaching this inflection point, the really exciting place on the S curve, where advances in the, you know, the quantitative technology can really make a huge qualitative leap in the experience you get out of it. So I, I actually, as a technologist, I feel super lucky to be part of this time, this period, when, when this is happening. Because presence, presence is disruptive. I mean, it's, it's, it's really that compelling. It's going to become pervasive. It's, uh, it's going to become the preferred medium for all sorts of applications, not, not just games. I mean, it'll be awesome for games, but it'll go beyond games. Letting people feel like they're present somewhere else, it, it's, um, it's going to impact all sorts of other kinds of entertainment and even non-entertainment applications. So just for example, actually, I, I've been working on something with a, a, a joint project with NASA and JPL. And um, they're actually here today. And we have really, I, I mean, the reason we're doing it is because it's super cool just to work with NASA. But, <laughs> <laughs> but also, the reason is we have two, two kind of main goals. The first one is um, they're already trying to use VR to do immersive science. And so we'd love to make hardware that's good enough for them to be able to do that. They're like a, you know, a sounding board for us. If they, if they can use it for that, then we're good. Um, secondly, we would like to create new experiences for our PlayStation owners so that when NASA gets to a new place, everyone who owns a PlayStation can feel like they're there exploring right along with them. And so one of the things that I worked on personally in this whole week we've been, we had the guys from JPL up working on it, is a Mars demo where you feel like you're actually standing on Mars, the surface of Mars. We have the real data captured by the Curiosity rover, and we have the real model of the rover that's kind of driving along next to you. VR is going to be pervasive, and what I mean by that is it's going to be all sorts of things you'd never think it would be used for. Maybe even something as simple and mundane as, like, you want to pick out a hotel room for your next trip. Just imagine just picking up your VR headset, put it on, and you're standing in the lobby of that hotel, and you make a decision. Am I going to stay here or not? That's the kind of use you might get. And there's already projects like uh, the Google Tango project, which is, you know, to capture data like that that you would need to create that kind of environment automatically. It'll be a few years before we can automate that process, but that's where we're going. So there's this awesome, awesome vision, you know, that we have of how important VR is going to be. How do we get there? Well, we've identified these six main areas. I mean, presence is, is hard. Presence is hard to achieve. That's why it hasn't happened in so long. But um, I think if we can nail these six areas, VR will be able to be a mass market industry. So the, f the first two, sight and sound, are really, we need to deliver really rich experience to our, our richest uh, two senses. Uh, we need the whole world, virtual world, to respond in a natural way when you move your head around. Uh, we need to be able to interact with that world, reach out into it. And then we need to do all this in a, in a very, easy to use, approachable manner. And then, of course, finally, we need to have the right content for it that leverages the new medium properly. So let me go into these in a little bit more detail to explain how we're doing some of these things. First of all, sight. Well, to, to achieve presence, we need, a, we need a high res, high frame rate, low persistence display. No problem. <laughs> but uh, actually, we need more than that, really. We need some specialized optics, too. I mean. We have this really small screen right in here, but we really want it to feel like this giant uh, world that's surrounding you. So that takes some specialized optics. Luckily, we have uh, a lot of expertise in this area from our parent, Sony. They, they're in the, done display technology and optics technology in a lot of products for many years. And we're really drawing upon that technology and that expertise 
And then of course, even when you have this great headset, you still need to drive it. And that's where the graphics power of PlayStation 4 is going to come in and be able to render these beautiful virtual worlds. Equally important, actually, is sound. I mean, again, Sony has a long, long heritage of audio technology. We have, you know, the Walkman, we have compact disc. And at PlayStation, we've always really put a huge emphasis on sound in games, Journey being a great example of that. In VR, sound is even more important, actually. Because in VR, you want to achieve this feeling of presence, it's really important that things sound like they would in the real world or in a consistent way with the graphics. So having spatialized sound is really important. And it goes even beyond that. Actually, the way the human brain works, you really use the directionality of sound to filter out what's important to you and what's not. So this directionality lets you be able to focus on the things you need to focus on. And if you didn't have that, it would be a giant cluttered mess in your brain of what's going on. So we've developed some new uh, binaural tech inside of SCA R&D, actually, to help with this. So next, tracking. Actually, tracking is really what makes VR VR. If you didn't have tracking, what you'd have is basically you'd have a kind of like a personal theater on your head, which would be this really wide screen field of view, which would be pretty cool, but it's just not VR at, at that point. What makes it VR is that it, when you move your head, all the virtual world reacts in a proper way. And of course, it's both the sound and the display that have to do this. And um, we're using the same kind of technology that we use with PlayStation Move for Morpheus. We have a, a lot higher um, rate sensors, inertial sensors, and we have, of course, the new PlayStation camera, which is uh, stereo and it almost seems like it was designed for VR, actually. <laughs> but, but actually, so we do, the, <laughs> we do the, the head rotation stuff, and rotation's kind of the minimum. You, you, I mean, of course, you need to be able to track the rotation. But actually, the position tracking is really key. The, the kind of cues that come from position tracking, the parallax, the occlusion, the specularities, the reflections, all those really contribute to presence in this kind of way that just makes it so much more real. So we use that. Uh, we really think that the tracking is kind of going to be one of those metrics that measures how good your VR is. So that brings us to control. And actually, interaction is what makes games games. That's the difference between it and other media. So this is, this is kind of my personal area of expertise. I've worked on this a lot. And uh, actually, PlayStation has really put a lot of focus into control. Actually, control in VR is a hard problem. There, there's going to be a lot of problems to solve down the road. Actually, I really like my job security right now, because <laughs> I think we're going to be working on this one for a while. But actually, PlayStation's in a great place as far as control goes. We have a, an awesome controller, which is DualShock 4. And it, it actually has sensors inside of it, and it has a light on the front. So it can be tracked by that same PlayStation camera as we use for Morpheus. And then we have actually PlayStation Move. PlayStation Move was actually kind of a little bit ahead of its time. You know, it is actually a really good VR controller, full six degrees of freedom. So we have a, we're really kind of happy with our positioning and control here. To really make this all matter to a lot of people, it's going to have to be easy to use. And what I mean is you're going to have to be able to drive to the store, buy one of these, come home, plug it in, turn it on, and it just works. It's, it, that's how you get mass adoption. You can't have to install specialized drivers and have specialized, you know, we really want it to be easy for people. And another way to make it easy is to make it comfortable so that you can put it on, it's easy to adjust, it maybe even automatically adjusts in some cases. And you could just have it, what, what our goal is, is to have it so it could just be sitting on the coffee table and when you want to go to VR, you pick it up, you put it on and you're in VR and you take it off and you're out of VR. We want it to be that easy to use. And these are the kind of things that consumer electronics companies have to worry about all the time. So, you know, we're used to working on this kind of area. So I, we'll, we'll get that one nailed. Last thing, it brings us to content. So at Worldwide Studios, we, we have a really good team. And, you know, they'll be delivering a seed of content to get this whole ball rolling. But the reason, like Shu mentioned, that we're announcing this here at GDC is we really need the entire development community if we want to achieve what we think is possible with VR. So, as a platform holder, it's our job to create this great content pipeline for you guys to be able to make these great experiences. So we're, we're working to get authoring tools, get engines, and get the whole distribution channel we, like we have already for PlayStation all in place for you guys to be able to deliver great VR content. We want to make PlayStation the best place for VR, and not only just for people playing VR, but actually developing for VR. 
So we're working with partners already. We have these partners. I didn't know it was animated. Um, yeah, so um, actually on the, on the NASA demo, we used, for example, we used Unity and Wise for the two middlewares for it. So we, um, we already have some of this that supports Morpheus, so it, we're uh, trying to make it, again, as easy as possible for developers to create content. But on the other hand, VR is very new. So some of you who want to dive all the way down into the metal and do these specialized graphics and rendering techniques, I think there will be a lot of space here for you guys, too. This is, this is a great, great time. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is like the wild, wild west. I mean, this is when there's no rules right now. There's no killer genre that you have to support. There's no, there's no uh, this is kind of like a once in a career kind of situation. You know, how often do you get to define a new medium? Well, that's what everyone who starts now can do. So it's really exciting. I'm, actually, I, I'm going to now get to introduce Anton. He's going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the ideas for how you might create content. But thank you guys very much. So my name is Anton Mikhailov. I work with Rick at US R&D. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you, you know, a bit about our long-term vision for Project Morpheus and also about our current diff kit uh, in more detail. So you know, to start out, our philosophy for VR is really that it's a medium. It's not a peripheral. And that's important to realize because the rules are going to be different. Um, presence is going to be the killer app for VR. And games will be just one type of content. In this scenario, the VR scenario, emotion is amplified beyond anything you've seen in traditional games. And that makes the experience very social, uh, unlike what people might think traditionally. And this experience will be for everyone. So what I mean by new medium is that really a lot of the rules that you're used to in game design just simply don't apply. In many cases, presence trumps game design. So it's much more important to have your game uh, deliver a sense of presence than it is you know, to sort of conform to a given genre of today. Uh, you know, it's really the player is going to be in the game, not observing it. So you should design it as an experience that a person can enjoy from within your game. Uh, conversely, typical game art can look kind of weird. Uh, normal maps don't always work. Uh, sense of scale can be quite off. Uh, we've seen many things like uh, doorways in games are too wide and too short. It looks fine on screen. In VR, you just feel like a hobbit or something, so it's kind of strange. Um, and you know, there's a lot of other game design things to talk about. Actually, this talk's really not long enough to cover all, uh, you know, all we've learned ourselves and from other companies, but I'll go through a few of them just to give you a taste. Um, the first one is that head motion for the player is law. You basically can't mess with this. If you mess with this, you make people sick. And this is a little bit of a culture shock for some developers, because they're used to you know, using field of view as an artistic thing or you know, camera positioning. Really, in VR, you want to keep the person's head where their head really is. And that's what gives you that sense of presence, and that also is what prevents people from getting motion sickness. So if you have a first-person game um, you know, that takes control of the person's camera often, you might consider doing actually a third-person game, which we found to be also quite immersive. And it's a new way of people to experience your content. You know, same for cutscenes. Cutscenes don't work very well because you're locking the person's view. So it's much better to put them outside of the cutscene and let them observe the cutscene naturally. There's also a lot of uh, you know, game design challenges, so to speak, that we don't really know the answers to. And we have some ideas, but it would be really great to talk to you guys throughout the week uh, to find some, some answers to these. So one of the interesting ones is arm positioning in VR. So you know, if I'm using something like the Move controller to track my hand, in the real world, I'm not a, you know, impeded by anything. But in the virtual world, there might be a wall. And so you might think that the best way to solve it is to sort of use some kind of IK system and you know, prevent the virtual hand to go through the wall. And that makes your game look nice, like in a screenshot. But actually, in VR, it feels quite weird, because you have a, a disconnect between where your hand really is and you know, where the hand is in the virtual world. So it looks we, uh, fine, but it feels kind of strange. So OK. There's another idea you can have is you can maybe draw the hand over everything else all the time. And that seems like a really clever hack at first. You say, well, now my art looks fine, and the person can see their hand. Uh, but actually, the, your eyes aren't so easily fooled. and so they feel the difference between where you're converging and where uh, sort of you're accommodating, and there's a depth conflict. And so that one kind of strains your eyes and confuses you further. And sort of ironically, the simplest solution, which is just ignoring the problem and letting the hand uh, clip through VR, actually works quite well. You might do an effect to sort of accentuate that this is a virtual space, but 
you know, actually just dealing with the problem that way lets the person feel oddly more present than, you know, clipping or accommodating. So that's just an example of one of the issues that you might encounter, and there's some non-intuitive solutions for this. And really, this goes back to presence. We really do believe presence is going to be the killer app. So it's very important that you keep to it. Uh, essentially, presence is very fragile. It's very easy to break by messing up technical factors or game design factors. So we'd like everybody to be you know, very well aware of that. And it's really the unique selling point of VR. This is what will drive people to VR games. So if you really don't feature presence, it's, you know, it's not clear why people aren't, wouldn't be playing your game on a screen. So to really achieve presence on the technical level, you'll need to hit a few key technical factors. There's other ones. Again, there's a lot more to go into than this presentation allows. But the big ones is keeping your latency low. Uh, this is, again, kind of a shocker for a lot of people. There's a lot of high latency games out there. Um, keeping your frame rate high, also very, very important. Uh, both latency and frame rate can get you into motion sickness land very rapidly if you mess those up, so please keep those good. And, uh, you know, calibration is also very important. I mentioned game art looks strange, so in addition to kind of optical calibration and tracking calibration and everything that, you know, we can handle for you on the hardware side, kind of calibrating your environment to be a real-world scale uh, or something similar to it or something at least self-consistent uh, again, helps a lot. Uh, we found that some games that are rendered very realistically don't give you a sense of presence because, like I said, you'll have a coffee table and a lamp, but their proportions are wrong or the doorway is too narrow or whatever. So that's important. And equally important is rendering the images cleanly. Avoid aliasing, avoid uh, weird post-processing hacks and things like that. So you really just have to do a good job on your imagery. And the 3D audio will really seal the deal. Like Rick was saying, 3D audio really helps you put put yourself into that world. And you know, a lot of people leave the, th the audio for last, but it's really quite important to design audio with VR kind of like at the same time. It really will help the sense of presence. It will amplify it. There's also other interesting ideas you can have for you know, different game genres. So for driving, for example, uh, contact points between your real hands and the virtual hands, like on the steering wheel, for example, will greatly increase the sense of presence because not only do you see your, your hands, you see your hands matched up to a physical object and you feel that object. So that haptic feedback helps a lot. And that's true not just for your hands, it's true for your feet if you have pedals. It's even true for your back and sort of like if you have the chair that the person is sitting in matched to the virtual game chair, it actually helps increase presence as well. Now, of course, you can't always do that. Uh, you know, if you're in a race car, you're not going to you know, bundle a race car seat with your game. Um, unless you really want to, but it's quite extreme. But, you know, actually matching your in-game seat to a typical player seat can actually be a good strategy to increase presence in your game. And, of course, for other types of games, you know, if you have a shooting game, a gun peripheral of some sort will greatly enhance it. Again, it doesn't have to match your game perfectly. You know, we have the PlayStation Move uh, gun attachment, and we've used that to simulate crossbows, you know, flares, shoot other different rifles. And that works because you can't see it, right? So you don't know. It's just a feeling. You know, of course, for sword-based game games or, you know, rackets or various sports tools, PlayStation Move does a great job because you actually feel like you have something in your hand. And the DualShock 4 on PlayStation is now also tracked. So if you have a game like a flight game, it quite resembles a flight yoke or something like that. So, I mean, the takeaway is really match your controller to whatever um, implement your, your virtual avatar will be using, and that will increase the sense of presence. And uh, like I mentioned before, games are really just going to be one type of content that take advantage of this. Uh, you can imagine how exciting it is to go to a foreign place for tourism. And virtual tourism, I think, was going to be just as exciting for VR. And it doesn't necessarily need to feature gameplay. I mean, if you go to visit a beautiful cathedral, you don't expect there to be gameplay associated with it. So in the same way, if you visit a beautiful place in VR, you don't necessarily need gameplay. So I think areas of interactive media should be particularly excited about this. Um, at the end of the day, though, games we still think are best in the sense of interaction providing you a grounding for the presence, and it gets you more involved in, into the game itself. So, uh, you know, and also at GDC, so we can't really say that that's not the best content. <laughs> but, you know, also game worlds tend to be the most fantastic ones, right? So you can do real tourism in the real world, but you can only do virtual tourism inside, you know, virtual environments. So a lot of the fantastic environments you create can only be experienced by VR, and so that's quite exciting for us. And uh, emotion in this space is really going to be amplified. So it, this is really above anything you would be able to experience in a traditional game because, you know, you have complete sensory blockout. This is the same reason people go to a movie theater rather than watching certain movies at home. You know, they want to be in a dark space with a large screen, you know, 
controlled audio, if you have some guy coughing in the front row or a cell phone goes off, immediately your immersion breaks down and you say that guy's annoying or whatever. And so the same thing is happening inside VR. This is going to be the first time where your game is literally the only thing the person is seeing, probably also hearing if they have full audio blocking headphones. And so you get a whole new palette of emotions you can experiment with. You know, you actually do get a sense of vertigo. So in a regular game, if you're standing on a ledge, you feel like maybe, okay, I'm going to, you know, die and have to restart or whatever. But in VR, you actually get a sense of fear when you're standing on a ledge. It, it can mess some people up. Uh, claustrophobia, fear of the unknown. Like a lot of these things are pretty intense. And so uh, you have a whole lot of new emotions to work with. So please be careful because some of these can really freak people out. But that's also incredibly fun to watch. And so <laughs> that's why we think the experience is going to be very social. Uh, I think that once people see people uh, you know, in VR, it's going to be rapidly a I want to play it too kind of scenario. And traditional online multiplayer is actually quite cool because if you have somebody over network um, in another space, well, remember, we have head tracking for VR already. We have hands tracking for VR already. And so you'll see their hands, and you'll see their head motion. And those things are accurate enough to deliver subtle body language cues. I mean, they have to be for VR. And so seeing another avatar is really, truly amazing. And we have, for example, a simple application where you can play a musical instrument using Move, but then you could also see somebody else playing. And you can actually use the body language from the tracking systems to you know, sync up like you would be in a real band. So it's really quite a, a physical experience. You see people's head move slightly. You see them look at this or that. You know which, you know, which drum they're going to hit next. So uh, the multiplayer aspect of it is really cool. But there's also kind of a couch multiplayer aspect of it as well. Uh, one of the features of our dev kit is that we have a processing unit that will mirror the image inside the headset onto the screen. So people sitting alongside with the person can, can see what they're experiencing. And I'll talk more about that feature later, but I think that's going to really accelerate the adoption of this with you know, out of the core market. And it's really going to be for everyone. I mean, finally, the hardware is going to be comfortable. I mean, if you've seen old VR hardware, there's this thing called like the alligator, I think. It's got like load balancing on the back. Um, this is comfortable, it's friendly looking, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to break your head or something. Um, and it works with people with glasses, it works with different head shapes. You know, we learned a lot from the Sony guys in making this happen. And the content is very varied, right? So if you want a very mild experience, just like some virtual tourism, look around, maybe interact lightly, you can do that. Um, you won't get motion sick, you know, and if you want a really extreme experience where you're barrel rolling a plane, you know, you might get motion sick from barrel rolling like you would in real life, but you're not going to get motion sick because of VR, right? You're going to have a choice of hardware. And so there's going to be people that like roller coasters and people that don't. So it's really going to be available for everyone. You know, and just like you have preference in, a re in regular games, you might have preference in VR games. And the experience can be shared, and that's what we'll allow to spread. So that's, I think that's going to be the, the key. Once people see somebody else interacting in VR, they're going to want to put it on and try it next. And so I'll, I'll go into our current dev kit current, uh, for now. So again, this is all tentative. Uh, but the current dev kit has a 1080p display and a 90 degree field of view. Um, that's actually 90 degrees for people wearing glasses, for those technical minded. Um, it's 15 uh, millimeters eye relief, and there's a quite uh, wide IPD range that we can work with. Um, you know, and it's, it's not necessarily the final thing that we're going for, but uh, it's a good sweet spot for now for developers. So we're quite excited. That's, it's at a stage where we can share it with you today. For the tracking, we're built upon PlayStation Move technology. And you know, we have 1,000 hertz tracking in a full 3 meter working volume. It's actually a 3 meter frustum, uh, since it's a camera, but effectively 3 meters. And it's full 360 degrees. So on the rear, you see that there's also tracking markers. So you can actually face away from the camera and still maintain position and rotation tracking. There's also forward prediction. So for games that have some pipeline latency, we can actually predict some of that away. It's sort of a crutch, so you should really try to get your game latency low as possible. You still might need some prediction anyway, because there's always going to be some render latency. Um, but it's a really good feature to get, you, get, get the ball rolling. And, uh, and you know, to mention again, the, the tracking is done by the same camera as the DualShock and the PlayStation Move. And you know, that's nice for customers, because they don't have to buy a new tracking system. But it's also very nice for developers, because if you've ever used other VR systems and had to calibrate two tracking systems together, you know, it's a royal pain. So it's really nice to avoid that and have the same tracking system for both of them, or for all three of them, really. For the 3D audio, Rick mentioned that we've um, done binaural uh, audio synthesis. And this is a sort of true spatial sound system uh, synthesized by simulating the human ear. Uh, this is different than like a virtual 
surround sound kind of thing. It's really rendering the sound in a similar way that you would render visuals into your ear. So it's a little hard to visualize because it's sound, but uh, that's effectively what's going on. And it was created by real world experience, uh, exper experiments using speaker microphones and arrays. This is actually our test rig setup. It's kind of crazy. Um, this is a fully blocked, huge, fully uh, soundproofed, huge room. And in the middle there, you see uh, a swivel chair so that person can rotate. And around it is an arc of speakers co covering from head to toe. And we use this setup to basically spin people through it and record audios for various uh, signal tones and stuff like that. And this allows us to, in post, simulate over 60 virtual speakers around you. And that's, you know, that's both distance and angle, right? So it really gives you a pinpoint precision of where the sound is truly coming from. And that, that really helps ex not only kind of enhance the sense of presence, but it gives you new gameplay ideas where you can just play a sound and people will turn just like they would in real life. And uh, for the ergonomics, you know, we have quite a unique design. Uh, we learned a lot from, you know, parent company Sony about consumer electronic head mount design because they've been doing this for quite a while. But we've also, you know, uh, taken our learnings from PlayStation and gaming to adopt it as a gaming headset. And we've really optimized this for comfortable use over a long term. So we've kept the adjustability that you'd find in a commercial VR headset, but we've also added a lot of comfort to it. So like I said, it's adjustable. Um, it actually supports 15 to 25 millimeter eye relief, again, just for this prototype. Uh, it's not necessarily final specs, but it's an open air design, so even though there's light blocking, there's lots of air coming through, and that avoids lens fogging, that avoids heating issues, um, keeps you cool, basically. And uh, most of the weight is actually on your head, so there's no weight placed on the nose or the cheeks. And that allows you to basically keep the headset on for a while without you know, having any pressure on your, on your face, because that can be quite a discomfort. Uh, there's also an audio jack directly on the head unit, so that if you have headphones, you can plug directly into it. Uh, you don't have to stretch a cable all the way to the PlayStation, but uh, of course you can use wireless uh, headsets as well. And uh, I mentioned the social screen feature earlier. We actually have a breakout box in between the head mount unit and the PlayStation 4. So that doesn't introduce any extra latency. It basically takes the signal and splits it off onto the main TV, and it creates an undistorted view of what the person is seeing inside the headset. So it's quite easy for people to understand what's going on. We found that it can be confusing if you show them the kind of standard binocular view that you would see. So it allows the people in the room to follow along with the person that's in VR. And what that does is it allows for a very unique asymmetric gameplay. So for example, I can be in VR while my friends could be sitting on the couch and say I'm like the hero of the game. They can be playing the monsters because they can see what I see. So they can play against me, even though they don't have a headset on, they're on the couch, they're playing against me, and whoever takes me down, for example, gets to play, you know, use the headset next, and they become the next hero, right? And so in that way, you can actually create a game where passing the headset along is a, you know, it's part of the game experience, and it's a very social thing, and that's, you know, that's a big thing, because traditional view of uh, VR from the media and stuff is a very solitary experience, and I think we could turn it into something you know, much more friendly for everyone. So you know, that's the overview of our dev kit, but uh, like I said, the best way to try the dev kit is to try our demos. Uh, we're gonna have different demos every day, but these, this is an overview of the demos that we'll have for you this week. And uh, the first one is The Deep from London Studio, from Worldwide Studios. And in this demo, you'll descend in a diving cage into the ocean depths and encounter some of the deadliest predators. We also have the castle demo from USR&D. And this demo f focuses on uh, PlayStation Move interactions, so you'll have a Move controller in each hand, and you can grab different objects. You'll be able to pick up a sword and bash a dummy with it, like mess with it, shoot it with a crossbow, chop arms off, and all sorts of interesting things. And there's a lot of Easter eggs in that one, so there, you, know, you can kind of keep playing with it. We are also very excited to be working with CCP to bring uh, their <laughs> Eve Valkyrie game. <laughs> so you can be in line first. Um, to bring Valkyrie to our dev kit. And so, you know, for those of you who haven't heard uh, about EVE, it's a really amazing spaceship dogfighting game based in the EVE universe. And, you know, it's one of the first games to be built ground up for, for VR, and it shows all the interactions and everything, the game design, the graphics, everything is done for VR. So it's a, it's a really exciting one for us. And we also have Thief from Square Enix which you, they've created a special build specifically for VR. So it's not the standard game, uh, but it's sections of the game that's a kind of more immersive experience from the Thief universe. So you can try that out as well. So 
those are the demos. Um, they're going to be on the show floor, but it's a first come, first serve basis. So there'll be tickets, and you know whoever shows up first, you get a ticket and you get a time, and you can come at that time. So you don't have to stand in like an eight hour line. You'll just get a ticket and show up at the right time. But the tickets are first come, first serve. So starting tomorrow morning, effectively. And there's different demos every day, so you know you can come multiple days and check out all of them. Uh, so. You know, to close up, this has been a, you know, more than a three-year journey for us. We're really excited to finally be showing it to you guys after all this time. But we're even more excited to see what you guys come up with. So thank you very much. Are there any plans for a VR-specific operating system that goes along with the headset? You mean for the PlayStation 4? Yeah, but something that's like separate from the PlayStation operating system. What, what do Would you it ever be standalone? I guess is what I'm asking. So, I'm sorry. Would it ever be standalone? I guess is what I'm asking. Standalone without a PlayStation? I mean, you need pretty powerful graphics hardware to drive it. So PS4 has that, and so uh, I'm I'm not yeah. sure. Right, right now we're focusing on how to use it yeah. with PlayStation 4 primarily. Hi. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, if there's going to be a wire leading from the headset to your PlayStation 4, and if you're hoping to eliminate that before the final model. So the current uh, prototype is wired. It's quite a long wire. Uh, I believe it's five meters. So we have a, because of our wide tracking range, we need a long wire. Um, we're you know, we're going to investigate other solutions. Obviously, everyone wants it to be wireless, so we'll look into it. But there's a lot of technical challenges. And do you have the final specs for what you're aiming for with the retail unit? Uh, we're not discussing final specs at this event. Got it. Thank you. At what time will the unit come out, and uh, for what frame rate and latency are you aiming for? So that's another final specs question. Yeah. Highest frame rate we can get and the lowest latency we can get. <laughs> <laughs> and coming out as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> might, might as well, might as well add for as low as possible, too. Right, <laughs> for as low as possible as well, yeah. Are you working with uh, Oculus or other headset makers to uh, synchronize your APIs or development environments for cross-platform development? I think for now it's only in spirit. I mean, we're, we're all in very much the same boat. We're all trying to push VR forward. So I don't think there's any standardized APIs quite yet. But... Thank you. I just was curious. Um, this is, of course, wonderful technology, and you're designing it for Sony PlayStation. Um, is this hardware something that would be applicable to other platforms, like PC, for example? Well, our current focus is going to be on PlayStation, but you know, again, that's not final spec. Let me rephrase the question. Um, your HMZ series uh, was very popular amongst PC gamers because it had HDMI connectivity, and of course it's not the same, uh, obviously you're doing much, much more. Um, do you see this as something that could be connected to PC? Do you see a future where it could go beyond the console world? Well, I mean, as a, as a technical person, it's you know, HDMI, USB, blah, blah, blah. It's compatible, but we're not discussing product decisions today. Okay. So. <laughs> You had mentioned passing the headset around from person to person at a couch. How many units are you shooting for a single PlayStation 4 using? Right now, it's a single HMU per PlayStation. Do you plan to use eye tracking from inside the device? We, we have research in, our, in my group that and Eric Larson does related to eye tracking. So it's one of the areas we look at for general gaming. So, you know, We'll it's always technology we're aware of. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you chaps have mobile connectivity on your roadmap? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry, mobile connectivity for the headsets. You can plug into, let's say, a Sony phone or a Vita. Uh, that's, again, more of a product question. Technically speaking, though, it, it does take a considerable amount of horsepower to render a good VR experience. So. Thank you. Uh, given the horsepower question, I'm curious uh, what kind of virtual reality experiences, the, um, whether the virtual reality experiences rendered by the PlayStation 4 will be uh, graphically less intensive than the games that are rendering it in 2D because you have to uh, split the amount of power among the two eyeballs. Actually, you know, graphically less intensive is not the right word. You, they'll be very <laughs> intensive graphically. 
You mean maybe less graphically uh, yeah, rich? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if, if there's any kind of reduction in overall graphical quality for the, uh, to be able to have it in three dimensions and, and have it uh, visually, you know, give you that sense of presence. It's, whether that's a trade-off or, or that's something else. It's a different thing because the, the graphics are so rich because you're immersed, it's a different kind of feeling. So you need a different kind of graphics optimization to make the experience good. Tomorrow, you guys can see, I think that some of the graphics look very, very good. So. Yeah, I think you can't should try wait. the demos yeah. and form an opinion. <laughs> um, it seems like Project Morpheus seems to work in conjunction with the PS Move to enhance the user experience and actually have them feel like they're in the virtual world. So do you feel like the next step in the process of actually having like Immer more immersive virtual reality would be to work on like haptic responses? I, I think haptics is another great sensory input that would further enhance presence, like Anton mentioned a little bit in his talk. Um, probably we're not cur currently working on any specialized VR haptic peripheral or anything like that, but I think uh, we already have some rumble in our, in our products and down the road, I definitely think haptics will be a big part of the peripherals that we will see for VR. Okay. I mean, it's kind of a Thank generic you. answer, but. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Uh, so talking a little bit again about um, the, the challenges of rendering multiple screens and that there's going to be um, some adapted view that's available for like the console TV for the people who are sitting in the room. Um, to what degree is their ability to render something different there uh, both to potentially lie to the player in the experience or outside of it, um, or to just give uh, an entirely different viewpoint on the same action or whatever, um, is essentially a third screen rendering being taken into account for the technology. Well, we have the capability to render to companion devices using you know, PlayStation companion apps and stuff like that. So that's actually a really good way for people to interact, not necessarily even using the TV. The current dev kit mirrors what's seen inside there onto the TV. But yeah, for other gameplay possibilities, it's an exciting area of research. Hello. I was wondering, what do you guys see for applications for VR for school systems for like virtualization of like ancient Rome and stuff? I'm working on a virtual museum project for, with the Oculus Rift right now. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, where do you, do you see this project being used in school systems at all and like ver training simulations at all? Because I know you guys are primarily an entertainment company, but would, do you think it would go into like simulation market possibly? for cheaper costs for schools, because they have limited funds nowadays? Yeah, I mean, one of the great things about something being consumer electronics is it is you know, accessible to those kind of industries as well, because it's affordable to them. Uh, there's, there's work right now down at USC on using VR for uh, you know, post-traumatic stress relief and things like that. So there's our, already those efforts are undergoing, and we hope that our, our hardware will be useful for those efforts, too. Yeah. And we Currently, our experience with NASA has been very positive. Yeah. So, you know, working with other schools or you know other institutions, I think, will be really exciting for us. All right, thank you. Congratulations, great, very exciting announcement. Um, on the list of content uh, creation and tool partners, there were several companies there that have uh, been associated with 3D, stereo 3D, gaming and content creation. You know, Autodesk and Crytek and DDD. Can you comment on the specific role you see 3D or stereo 3D playing together with your uh, new Morpheus device? Maybe hopes, concerns, just general comments, please. By stereo 3D, you mean like uh, video or audio? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, video, yes. Video, OK. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's different than 3D cinema because, you know, 3D cinema, you basically you take the image with a virtual camera and then when you present it on the screen, you just kind of shift things to make it look parallaxy. y um, This is fundamentally different because we're actually rendering the correct view for each eye. So there's a lot of learnings from stereo 3D. Uh, you know, they, they do try to calibrate things as well as they can and stuff like that. So, you know, those partners have a lot of expertise in things like optics and all of that. But you know, the experience is different than stereo 3D TV. It's not, it's not really the same thing. Yeah, you're rendering two views, but you know, the way you consume that is just completely different. Yeah, so, but, but some of the tools will yeah. overlap. So, so some of those tools that help you render 3D, uh, especially the authoring tools, will be useful for VR authoring. 
Thank you. Hello again. I'm wondering the significance of Project Morpheus as a name and which first party Sony Studios are making games for the headset. That's a shoe question. Well, well um, <laughs> we, we decided on this name last week, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this could have been something totally different. It was chosen because Morpheus is the god of dreams, and so it's, it's sort of uh, it's supposed to evoke the feeling that uh, you know, it could be a dreamlike experience inside the headset. So not a Matrix reference then? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which first party studios are making games for the headset? Sorry? Which first party Sony studios are making uh, games yeah. for the HMU? So the Anton showed the uh, screenshot of the Deep. It's uh, uh, done by London Studio. London right. Studio has a lot of experience, you know, working on the, you know, augmented reality and 3D input and uh, so that's, one example. And the other studios are kind of experimenting. Uh, the number of units you know, are still limited right now, but we are able to produce more of this unit for all developers. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting more studios to uh, work on you know, something cool. Thank you. Uh, have you let your kids try it, or any kids? If so, did they like it? Were they excited? And do you have any recommended age ranges you could release right now? We, we don't have a recommended age uh, range yet. That's, again, like more of a product question and the decision there. Uh, having said that, we've had young people try it, and they've been very excited about it, obviously. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like that's what they expect, right? It's, it's sort of a, yeah. yeah, it's awesome. what you see in the movies. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so I'm being told we're supposed to take one more question. That's, sorry. That's you. <laughs> oh, me? OK. All right. Um, I wanted to ask about locomotion. So you can put your hands in the game with the PlayStation Move. Are there any plans to get your feet in there to let you walk around these virtual environments? Yeah, that's, that's I mean, we've had some research stuff on, on that, and there's a lot of research in other companies and on the internet and whatever. Uh, you know, everyone has their own opinion about how well that works. Um, What's your opinion? It's an active area of research. It's an active area of research. I mean, I've tried a few different things. Some of them work better than others. Um, it, de it depends on kind of what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to accomplish more of a feeling of immersion, I think actually physically locomoting is better than kind of walking in place. That's why we have a quite wide tracking range. Um, but, you know, obviously you can't walk forever. And so, you know, locomoting in place can be a replacement for that. And I, I think that teleportation is very cool. So that's another solution. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, that's it. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much.